everybody. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. It's good to see everybody. Uh, we're just going to continue in worship. I'll do a couple announcements. And we don't, we don't want to break the flow of worship. It's good to have everybody. Amen. Amen. So just a couple announcements real quickly. First of all, how many people had fun last week? How many people were here last week? Maybe to start off. Praise God, right? So good to have some of our friends from Atlanta. Did you guys enjoy worship last week too? Wow. I just felt the peace of God as we were worshiping last week, just in a special way. I'm just thankful for that. I'm thankful that we can worship outside. Amen. A lot of people are not meeting right now, but God has blessed us to be able to meet. Amen. So, so good to have our friends uh, and family from, from the East Coast and uh, Thunderstorm Ortiz as well. That was awesome. So, uh, getting back into groups, we have some some awesome groups going on this week too so we have my my parents home group going on first and third wednesdays right back to normal schedule okay um that's over in the happy valley area so if you're looking to get connected in a home group awesome place to be at there as well um then we have a men's group and a live men's group at dean's on thursdays praise god so uh god is moving in that place people are coming to the lord it's powerful is powerful. I know because I've been there. <laughs> so any uh, any of the men here, we want to just encourage you to get connected. This is a great, great spot to do it um, over at Dean's in the Milwaukee area, not too far from here. Amen. Uh, we still have our food boxes, and this has been a huge blessing that we've been able to do um, each Sunday. So a lot of you guys see it as we're coming in. Food went really quickly uh, this morning. So our neighborhood is just thankful. I think mm -hmm. they're really thankful to us that we're able to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's been a big blessing to the community. So thank you everybody who helps out, uh, Katrina. And I know the sweats, there's so many people who are helping this morning. We really appreciate it. Um, and then again, we're gonna have our last meal on, I believe it's the 27th of this month. Okay, so that, that's the last Sunday of the month. We'll have our, our, uh, our meal here. Um, we gotta, we gotta give a give good thanks to Fred over yeah. here for the love that he puts into that food. Amen. Just like last week. So pr praise God for that. So, um, if the, the ushers could come, we're going to take our, our tithes and offerings here and, uh, I'll just bless our, our tithe. How many of you guys know it, it's all God's anyways. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's all his anyways. So I just thank God what I'm just going to, we just say, thank you, Lord, for everything that you blessed us with God. And You've always provided for us. You are our provider, Jehovah Jireh, and we thank you, Lord. And this is just another way, Lord, to just give back to you, to, to bless the house of the Lord and to put this this money back into your hands, Lord, so that, that we can continue to be your hands and feet and be a blessing to this community, a blessing to this neighborhood, a blessing to this church. So, Father, we thank you. We pray that you would uh, bless every, every piece that goes into here, Lord, and use it for your glory. Mm -hmm. We ask all these things in, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to pass it to Pastor Keith real quickly to come and share a testimony about how faithful God is. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Amen. Pastor Keith. Good morning, church. Because all my life, all my life he's been faithful. Even when I didn't see it. Yeah. I'm actually going to give you a testimony of somebody else. And the reason I say it like that is because Kimmy and I were just the hands. So we had this homeless man that we've been ministering to for months, I would think. Um, his name's Bob. Bob's really angry at God. And the reason Bob was angry at God is because his nine-year-old daughter passed away from a car wreck. He had a lot of anger. And we said, it's okay. It's okay to be mad at God. It's okay. Every relationship you might have, that I might have, there's times when you and your friend get mad at each other. And he has the same question that we all have had at one point or another in our life. And that is, why did God let it happen? I had scripture for him. I pray with him. I had some answers for him. I'm not going to share that with you. But he's been coming in and from the money he scrounges up for the little jobs he does, he buys a coffee and a bear claw if he can. Then he comes in one day and he has a walker. I'm like kind of looking at him like, what's going on, Bob? 
What you need to know about Bob is Bob's probably like 62. And uh, you can tell by his demeanor, by his skin, by his things that are wrong with him that are obvious that he had a rough road. <laughs> and he might have made some bad choices. But he's getting there. He comes in with a walker and he goes... And he always usually starts with, good morning, can I have my coffee? And he comes up to me and he goes, good, good, good. And he, I told him not to speak again. He's like, Bob, did you have a stroke? Yeah. He shakes his head. It's like, when did that happen? He said, two days ago. I was like, Bob, why are you here? <laughs> he said, they let me go. I said, okay. I got him his coffee and stuff and helped a couple other people and I went over to the table and I asked him, can I sit, can I, can I have the Lord heal you? And he shook his head, yes. I didn't ask him, can I pray for you? Something touched me that in that moment, there was compassion in me that I didn't have before. So I said, we had a conversation and in the conversation he said why did god let the stroke why did god let the stroke happen what did i do and i said you didn't do anything specific i go but let me tell you what happened and this word came out of me and this was the word you're gonna have a paul moment and in three days you're gonna get better and in three days after that you'll be fully restored if you know me, that's not me. You might think I'm like this, like powerhouse or whatever. I don't know what you think of me. But let me tell you, there's all kinds of like, uh, what, what, huh? What's going down? I don't, okay, God, if you say so. And it's just stepping out. And three days later, Bob walked back in and said, good morning. How are you? The walker was not with them. He came up on his bike. He was still stuttering just a hair. And I saw him each day after that. And it is like nothing had ever happened. Let's give God praise. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every And all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, your goodness. Running after us, Father God. Running after yes. us, Lord. Amen. Could our ushers come uh, for communion, please? First Sunday, we get to honor the Lord in communion. Praise God. I'm just going to share a couple scriptures with us about communion. It goes perfectly with what we've been singing in worship. It's amazing. God is faithful when we are unfaithful. We, we could just go home right there. I'm reading in, in Deuteronomy. I'm just stuck in the Old Testament right now. And there's the covenant that the Lord gives to Abraham, right? It says your descendants will be as the stars in the heaven. Abraham is well beyond childbearing age. 
Same with his wife, and he's sitting there like, how, Lord, can this be? How in the world can this be? And as we know, Abraham was not perfect. Uh, you guys can go ahead and pass out. Abraham is not perfect, right? There was an Ishmael moment. How many of us have had Ishmael moments? Amen? Just me? Okay. But you know what? The child of promise, Isaac, still came to pass. Despite the unfaithfulness. He, he, let's even go a step further. It says in Hebrews that, a, uh, that Abraham inherited through his faith. So how can God call a man who was unfaithful, faithful? How is that possible? We have a God who transcends what we can do because Christ lives within us. That's the new covenant. It's the new covenant. Listen to this. Through the sprinkling of blood, Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, into the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. This is the blood of Jesus Christ, which allows God to say that this man was faithful in the midst of unfaithfulness. This is a God that never fails. This is a God who is faithful for us. When we stumble each day, when we have opportunities to step up to the plate, to fulfill the mandate, to fulfill the commission that he's put on our lives, and we fall short, he still says to you, you are faithful. That's grace. That's great. Jesus said grace and truth are realized through Jesus Christ. This is why communion is special, at least to me. Because this new covenant, that's what it gives us. It gives us a covenant of grace and truth. So that a faithful God can call an unfaithful man faithful. I am so thankful for that. Amen? It, gosh. This second verse speaks to this real quickly. And then we'll take, we'll, uh, take part in the elements. This is from 2 Corinthians 3. It says, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ cared for by us written not with ink but with the spirit of the living god not on tablets of stone but on tablets of the human hearts such confidence we have through christ toward god not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves but our adequacy is from god who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. Yes, Amen. amen. This, <laughs> the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. When we partake in the new covenant and we partner with the Holy spirit who resides within us, life is the result. Life is the result. Life was the result for that man. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. That is so encouraging to me. As somebody who fails again and again and again, that the, that the spirit brings life. Amen. So as we partake in the elements, just be thinking about those things in your life where you say, God, I, I've fallen short. I've been, I've been unfaithful in this area. I haven't done what it takes. I've stumbled in this area. What is that area in your life? Make, make communion personal. This is a personal, this is between you and the Lord. What is that area? We come to Luke. He says, and when the Lord, when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which he has given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then the same way he took the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup, which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Father, we thank you for your son your greatest act of love, your original plan, Jesus Christ, who you allowed to come down to this earth to pardon our sins, where we fell short, he became sin on our behalf and fulfilled the debt that we can never pay. So God, we say thank you 
for your son. Thank you for this new covenant that allows us to live a life of grace and truth through the Holy Spirit. We say thank you. We partake in your body. We partake in your blood in Jesus name. Let's take the bread and take the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. With that, we're in for a treat today. Let's give a welcome to our pastor, Pastor Alpha. So he brings the word. Thank you, John. This morning. Thank you, man. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, worship team. Thank you to everybody. Come on. I feel like I got served a treat already. You talking about me being that. Listen, you preached a good one. How about we just go home? You guys all right with that? Let's just let's just go eat. And go home. That was good. How are you today? Do you know there are several several people in this church that make everything happen every single week and I just want to say thank you. Would you please help me say thank you by just giving them uh, applause? There's I mean ushers and People who do stuff throughout the week. You know, uh, Eric taking care of the yard and doing all that. I mean, Fred building fences and making food and ushers and Katrina cleaning the building and food ministry that goes down by like eight people helping make that happen and chairs being placed where they're supposed to be and Colby doing video and the worship team just taking care of what needs to be taken care of and meeting and practicing. Just thank you to everybody who's been making church happen. Man, I'm thankful. And, and I'm excited. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm also excited about the growth that I've seen in people's life over the years here at the church. People who are not the same today than when we first met them. And I'm not just talking about people who just got saved a year ago or six months ago or three years ago. Also, people who have been walking with the Lord for a long time that the Lord had been doing some stuff inside of them. Do you, do you agree with me that it doesn't matter how long you've been going to church? It doesn't matter how long you profess to be a Christian, that the Lord is constantly at work in our hearts doing a work. D does the word not say that he who has begun a work in you will continue that work? Can we give God praise for that? The Lord is good. Before, before I get started, because you know I'm about to go right now, um, Brother Forrest just has a word of encouragement, and um, I appreciate Brother Forrest. Can you guys welcome him? Just let him share something real quick. You have the microphone, brother? Just push that button. Yeah, come on over here, man. Just share, share what the Lord put on your heart. My wife went to California, and I got the responsibility. Everybody has responsibilities here. I got the responsibility of watering her plants, praise God. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so, I stayed out late, worshiping up at Vancouver, and I came home, and I was like, well, I'm going to water them in the morning. I wake up in the morning, and they're wilted, and I'm like, oh, God, she's going to kill me. <laughs> and uh, then when I started watering them, I was praying and then the Lord put it on my heart, you should probably share this. And I said, Lord, I haven't, I don't really go to your, this church. I haven't really professed to be a member here. But I was like, okay, if this is you, I'll share it. I don't know how many of you in your life have something going on that you want God to get out of your life or you want him to work in your life. When, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I tried from the age of 12 to 30 to try to get rid of addictions in my life. I was, uh, five drug treatment centers, uh, one prison, ran 22 months in prison. I never could get the addiction out of my life until I moved to Portland and I started reading his word and I started walking out his word and I started putting his principles to work in my life. But until I put his word in my life, nothing ever changed permanently. Uh -huh. And so th the word that he gave me was the when I watered that plant, he said, share with the church until we start reading his word daily. And 
until we start eating of the bread of life, the things in our life are still going to give us turmoil. They're going to be directing us away from him. And the, so I went, to, after I watered that morning, I came back about three o'clock and I started talking to this young man that uh, I'd been praying for for a long time and he had uh, had mental problems and he's supposed to come over to my house tonight. And uh, I said, you know what? The same way I put God's word in my life, you're putting it in yours. And the first time he professed to me, I have a mental illness and God's healing me of it. I said, you know what? Right now I'm going to walk around the back of my house. And I was worried that I'm going to get in trouble with my wife because I killed her plants. And this is a whole freaking garden. <laughs> and uh, the, the tomato plants are all alive. The, all, of the, all of the leaves stood back up. Everything was st standing back up. And c come December 8th, be only because of God's word that I put in my life, I'll be sober 20 years on December 8th. Come on. Thank you, Forrest. Yep. That's one thing I love about this church, man, is when when you want to find a reason to run or you want to find a reason why you can't trust the Lord anymore, you just go ahead and talk to a few people and let them share with you what God's done in their life. And guess what? All that feeling sorry for yourself and wanting to run away, you just start changing your mind after that. I'm encouraged today. God is good, man. He really is. He really has been faithful my whole life. He really has been. Now, I've, I've done things that I can't blame God for. But he has always been faithful. And, and I believe that he will always be faithful to you. I want to start this morning in Jeremiah chapter 4. I want to read a few verses of scripture there that I'm just going to take off in the message. And um, this, this is titled, Breaking Up is Hard to Do. Breaking up is hard to do. I'm not going to sing the song for you, though. It's a great one. <laughs> Verse 1 of Jeremiah 4 says, O Israel, says the Lord, if you wanted to return to me, you could. You could throw away your detestable idols and stray away no more. Then when you swear by my name, saying, as surely as the Lord lives... You could do so with truth, justice, and righteousness. Can I ask you a question? What is one of the things that you hear everybody in our nation yelling for right now? Justice. It says, then you would be a blessing to the nations of the world, and all the people would come and praise my name. This is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts. In some translations, it says, break up the fallow ground. Don't waste your good seed among thorns. O people of Judah and Jerusalem, surrender your pride and power. Change your hearts before the Lord, or my anger will burn like an unquenchable fire because of all your sins. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He was a very young prophet. He was barely 20 when God called him to be his messenger. Matter of fact, Jeremiah said, I am way too young to be your prophet. And the reason why he said that is because he knew that what he would say to the people would not hold enough weight because they would look at him and say, you're trying to tell me something from God. But the book of Jeremiah is an important book. I mean, all the books are important, but there's something that's great about this book, something that's a little different uh, that's in this book, and that is you get to see a clear glimpse of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the book of Jeremiah. You can study that. You can read more. Jeremiah 31 is where, where you want to peer into that. But breaking up is hard to do. Having a hard heart means there's going to be some hard work. And breaking up with things is hard to do. 
I'm not talking about breaking up with girlfriends or boyfriends today. I'm not, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, marriage stuff. What I'm talking about is breaking up with the things that you've had in your life, whether short term or long term, that there are some things that as you walk as a Christian, the Lord begins to show you it's time to break up with this. Yep. Where he says, you know, I understand why you've had this and why you've carried it so long, but now I want to set you free from it. So it's time to break up with it. And you see, it's hard to break up with something that you have attached to you and made it a part of your identity or made it a part of your survival. Where the Lord wants to say, you don't need this for your identity and you don't need this for your survival anymore because I'm your survival. Your identity is found in me. So, and, and, and you know what? God does not like to share. He does not like to share. He, he doesn't like to, that, that, that's why he's not okay with the thought of you can worship all these other gods in him too. Didn't we just read it in Jeremiah four? He said, you can go ahead and get rid of your idols if you want to. That's what he's saying. He said, you could do it. So you can't, you, you can't cry out for God's touch and God's freedom and make a home for idols at the same time. You can't say, well, this, you know, that, and what it is, if we're honest, is sometimes what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, you got to really do a good job of convincing me that there's, there's something better before I'm going to let this go. And you know what? Faith is faith. I'm not a salesman. I think I do preach pretty good most of the time, sometimes. But my job is not to sell you anything. Either you choose to have faith or you don't. And that's why I don't enjoy debating. I think I can argue and debate actually pretty good. But I don't enjoy it. Because especially when it comes to terms of faith, this is faith. You either believe in the word of God as truth, you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and he died for your sins and he rose again on the third day, or you do not. There's nothing to debate about. It's pretty simple. You have to have faith. You know, dry ground, it, it, it happens because of, I mean, no water, a lot of heat. Just dry, just dry ground. I mean, that's how it gets dry. And then when it gets really dry, it cracks. And when you have to go do some yard work, when you got to go till the soil, you got to move some dirt. When it's hard, man, that is difficult to do with a shovel. I, I know you can go to Home Depot and rent something. And they didn't have Home Depot back in the day. They had ox. But it's hard to break up that ground. But if you start to break it up, it starts to loosen. And you know why you got to break it up? Because you have to break it up. You got to till it. You got to get rid of uh, stuff in the soil that, that shouldn't be there. Because if you're going to plant some seed, if you're going to put something in the soil that's going to produce in your life. Come on, is somebody hearing me this morning? Amen. If you're going to put something in the soil that's good for your life, it's got to be in good ground. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, does Jesus not talk about the seed and how some of it fell on good ground and some of it didn't? Talking about seed getting trampled by the feet of men. Can I tell you something about the time that we're in right now? In the time that we're in right now, if you're not careful, you'll grab a hold of a doctrine that's not even called a doctrine. And you'll make it a part of your life because somebody put enough power and enough emotion behind it to convince you that that needs to be your new belief system. Your belief system has to always come from here. It has to remain in here. It doesn't matter how mad somebody gets, how many mobs there are, or how intimidating somebody wants to be. Listen to me. You ought to not be afraid of nobody except the living God. You ought to be afraid of nobody. The Bible tells us don't fear any man. Don't fear what man can do to you, but fear what your father in heaven can do to you. You might be able to hurt this flesh, but you're not, you're not able to do what God has already promised me when I'm gone. You see what I'm saying? 
So we got to be careful because people will say, oh, no, that's not the truth. This and this. And they start. Well, history says, well, you know what? If we really want to look deep into history. We ought to be ashamed. There's there's more things to be ashamed of than proud of. If you really want to start getting into history. In our nation right now, with all, all of the things going on that have to do with racism and injustice and classes of people and, and you know, just attack on our government officials like police officers and just things, like, all these things that are happening right now where it ju it's just easier to hate. It's just easier to be mad at and hate and blame somebody. Well, you know what? Where you start to see the beginning of all that is in Genesis. You start to see it right away in Genesis. And guess what? We're not no different today. When you read, you know, I was, I've, I've been studying the people of Israel and, and coming out of uh, bondage from Egypt and, and the 10 plagues and what the 10 plagues mean and all this kind of stuff. And you know what? Not much has changed. Not much has changed. As a matter of fact, you have Egyptians that are holding Jews as slaves. We got black on black slavery happening in the Old Testament right there. But you know what? All of this stuff didn't have anything to do with color. Matter of fact, when it comes to the Lord, he doesn't care what color skin you got. He cares what kind of heart you got. These things that have happened abuse and neglect and just things that are unfair injustice you know all these things that we're talking about yes it's real yes it has happened to many people it has happened to some of you it has happened to me but you know what freedom is not found in holding grudges freedom is not found in staying angry about something that i can't change in the past freedom doesn't come from that freedom comes from letting it go and saying, Lord, I put all of this in your hands to let you handle it for me, how you see fit. And let me tell you something, ain't nobody got my back like Jesus Christ and my wife. <laughs> you make my wife mad, you be, I can't help you. You better call on Jesus. I have had terrible things happen to me because of my skin color, because of my background, because of just where I was at. I spent time in the South, four and a half years. I've been through things in my life that things, some things I don't want to talk about because they're embarrassing, but I want to tell you something though. God has touched my life. He has done a work inside of my life. I used to be such an angry, angry guy. I mean, I mean really angry. I mean, every once in a while I get angry, but the way I used to get angry, even as a saved Christian, e even as a saved person, as a Christian, is embarrassing the way I would act. But God has set me free. And that freedom didn't come like this. That freedom for me was a process. And part of that process was making sure to trust God and to put this in my life. Listen, we, we are, as a nation, nothing is going to change or get better until we start believing in the word of God and we start trusting God the way we used to. That's the only way it's going to change. It won't change any other way. We can throw money at all kinds of programs. We can do all of that stuff and we can have good, good works, good works, but that's all that they will be as good works. Okay. We can have all kinds of social this and social that. Listen, we need God. We need God. We need his word in our life, okay? We need it in our life, all of it, every single bit of it, not parts of it, not the parts we like and not pay attention to the parts we don't like. We need all of it. All of it has changed my life. I'm standing before you today as the pastor of this church, not because I ever deserved it, but because he chose me and he called me. And it's only because of my faith and belief in this that I'm where I'm at today. God is good. In, in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, I said, plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. Where does righteousness come from? 
Where, where does justice come from? Where does love come from? It comes from the Lord. He said, hey, get your ground ready. Get your heart ready. And then pray. Come to me and let me pour it out on you. What causes hard ground? Unresolved pain. Broken trust. Unforgiveness. Bitterness. These things create hard ground. A hard heart. Do you know that you could be going to church for years? Be a pastor. Be an evangelist. Be a prophet. Be a, be a worship leader. Be somebody who's responsible for planting several churches or starting many businesses or nonprofits. You could be a big time, big shot and still have a very, very serious problem with a hard heart. You, and, and you can always prove it because all you got to do is just push that right button. Just find out which button it is and just push it real good. And you're going to see it come right out. Oh, you still got that in there. That, but don't look at him too hard because you have to say, welcome, to, uh, we're in the same boat, you know. In Mark chapter 8, 16 to 18, at this, they began to argue with each other because they hadn't bought any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying. So he said, why are you arguing about having no bread? Y'all should have went and saw Katrina. because She got plenty of bread. He says, don't you know? Or understand even yet, and this is what he says, are your hearts too hard to take it in? Then he says this, you have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? What is this scripture teaching us? It's teaching us that there is a direct correlation behind what's going on inside your heart and what you're able to receive. Yeah. Seeing something and hearing something and taking something and eating something all has to do with receiving. And this scripture, Jesus is talking about the hard heart and then he says, oh, but you can't see? You can't hear? Come on now. You know, you know because when somebody's tried to talk to you about something and you just can't hear it. Because you're too mad. You're too angry to hear it. You have somebody talking to you about something for all these years of your life saying, I've been telling you or I told you all these years. That's why you can't hear it. You hear it like this. And you know what? Sometimes you come to church and you hear these sermons. They go. Psh, psh. You have a spouse trying to talk to you. Yep, men ain't the only ones to do that. Come on now. Young people ain't the only ones that do that. You see, it has to come in and it's got to sink deep into your heart. The word of God will change your heart. But you have to let the word of God change your heart. See, a hardened heart is going to affect how you see and hear. Guess what? It's going to affect your understanding. Doesn't the Bible talk about seek to understand? You see, there's things that you won't understand because your heart is too hard. And the Lord is saying, let's break up this heart. Are you receiving what is good for your heart? Did you know that you are the gatekeeper of your heart? Did you know that? That you're responsible for what rests and lives and resides in your heart? Come on now, can I say it again? You are responsible for what is in your heart. If something's in your heart that's not right, you get to remove it. If something needs to be in your heart, you get to put it in there. We can't stand before the Lord and blame anybody for what kind of heart I got. Because we are the gatekeepers of our hearts. Didn't the Lord say, guard your heart above all else? Because out of it flows the issues of life. Woo! <clears throat> oh, Lord. Guard your heart above all else. 
You're polishing the armor. You're sharpening the sword. But you better guard that heart. Romans 16, 17, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you have learned. Keep away from them. I like to have conversations, but I'm not friends with everybody. I don't care to be friends with everybody. Can I tell you something? My responsibility as a Christian is not to be everybody's friend. There are going to be some people that I can't be friends with because our hearts don't align. You see what I'm saying? I can be loving and I can be respectful, but I don't feel obligation to have to be everybody's friend. Not everybody is going to like me and not everybody is going to like you. And you are very likable people. Especially Fred on the last Sunday of the month when he's cooking that food. He's a very likable person. <laughs> Second Peter 2 verse 1 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them bringing swift destruction on themselves. In this time right now, in this time that you would call a trying time or a very tumultuous time, a very uh, uneasy time, there will be leaders who will rise up. Yep. Not just in the church, outside of the church. They'll rise up and they'll have a following. And they will lead people and they'll teach people things. They won't even have to say, hey, I'm the leader, follow me. They'll just rise up and people will start following them. And some of those people are working for God. And some of those people are working for the devil. And you know what? Most of those people working for the devil, they don't even know it. That's why you got to be careful. Doesn't the Bible tells us to test the spirits, to see whether they are of God or not? That's why it's important to know your words. So when you hear somebody saying something, you go, uh-uh, that's not what the word says. That God doesn't say that. The Bible says to be angry and do not sin. I have a right to be angry. Yes, you do. But as a Christian, you're not allowed to sin with it. First John 4, 1, dear friends, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Are you still with me? You doing okay this morning? I believe God wants to heal hearts today. You know, Jesus taught about inner purity, especially when he addressed the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He talked about, and if you want to read about it, Mark chapter 7 is a good place. In verse 7. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Does that still happen today? For you ignore God's law, and you substitute your own tradition. Then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. This, all of this takes a lot of work. To be religious takes a lot of work. To be controlling takes a lot of work. To try to manipulate a system for gain takes a lot of work. But for freedom, the work was already done. The price has been paid by Jesus Christ. He says you just need to receive it and you need to walk in it. The work has already been completed. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant it is all finished. And you see, as, as you read more, what Jesus does is he talks about what really defiles a person. Verse 20, and then he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what 
defiles you. Sin resides in the heart. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The human heart is the most deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? If I'm having a hard time hearing, if I'm having a hard time seeing, perhaps what I need to do is ask God to address my heart and show me what's in my heart that I need to get rid of. You see, sometimes we say, oh Lord, change my heart. And then he says, okay, here's what's in there. Okay, change it. And God says, you change it. Because you're making room for it, so remove it. It's, it's that simple. You know, we, hey God, do this for me. Do, do that for me. And you know, there are some things that only God can do. But there are some things where God said, I've given you the ability to do this. This is one of the things that my son died for is so that you can walk in this and so that you can do this. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when we have received Christ, that we're actually already seated with him in heavenly place. That's something that you and I can't do on our own. But there are some things that we can do, like say, get out. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Get out. That's like living in an apartment that you know you shouldn't be in, right? There's roaches everywhere and mold everywhere. And you say, oh God, get me out of this apartment. And he said, open the door and walk out. Come on. Open the door and get out, right? There's stuff in our heart where God says, okay, tell it to go. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Do you know that a lot of, I won't say all, I'll just say a lot of demonic activity, a lot of demonic oppression and possession in people's life is because of what they allowed to have in their heart. Did you know that? Because it gives permission. Because the enemy, listen, demons look for rights and permission to be there. And as soon as you take away the permission and they know that you're standing with Jesus, that's why the Bible says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he must flee from you. That means he can't be like, no, the Bible says you got to go now. But you see, with, with that, you got to let all that emotion go. You got to let all that stuff from the past go. You got to let it all go. And you have to say, you know, that's not me anymore. That's not me no more. I'm not going to identify with that anymore. Sometimes, you know what, if it helps, sometimes you do need to change your name. Right? I mean, they change their name a lot in the Bible. But sometimes, if that's what you got to do to completely rid yourself of that old way, go ahead. You know, some people, when, when, when they get saved, they change their clothes. They get a new hairstyle. I'm not saying you have to do that, but you know what? A lot of people do that because they... They say to themselves, I do not want to be identified as that anymore. Amen. Right? Come on, chasing glory that used to be Ace Boogie. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. You don't know his story. That dude was a serious, serious dope slinger. Big time. Walking around with twenty to $30,000 in his pocket any day of the week because he was moving that much weight of product. Day in and day out. And God talked to him and said, I'm going to give you one more chance. And if you don't listen to me, then what's going to happen is going to happen and I'm not going to help you. And he said, okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I can't be identified by that life anymore. I got to let that go. The Bible tells us in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, Jesus said, you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. I want to close the sermon with this scripture right here. How can you love the Lord with all your heart if you still got a bunch of stuff in your heart that shouldn't be there? How can you love the Lord your God with all your soul when your soul is directly affected by what you've allowed to stay in your heart. 
And then how can you love the Lord with all your mind when your mind is going crazy because your soul's not right and your soul's not right because your heart's not right? You see, this is not only a command. This is a key for freedom. You know, there are certain ways we shouldn't act anymore. When we are believers walking with Jesus, there are certain ways we shouldn't act anymore because we're Christians. And the only reason why we would still continue to act the way we shouldn't is because there's something in our heart that needs to go. It's that simple. Yes, you can say, you know, it's because that person talked to me this way or that person cut me off or this person stole from me or, yep, you can go ahead and just say all of that and just keep it right there if you want to. But if you really got down to it, if you really got real about it, you could say, Lord, show me what's in my heart. And guess what? God will show you what's in your heart. He will show you. He's faithful, man. He'll tell you the truth. We're just not always going to like it. That's the thing that's tough about it. We allow stuff to be there because we believe we have a right to feel that way. Well, how long do you want to feel that way? I would rather be free. Would you rather be free? I mean, you want real joy in your life? You, you just, you start letting stuff go and guess what? There's a lot of room for joy, yeah, right? You ever met Christians where you're, you, they're so grumpy, you're like, I didn't know you were saved. My goodness, I can't even be around you. Man, I was having a good day till I walked next to you. My goodness, what is going on? Something funky with your spirituality. And you know what? It's that, it's that heart stuff that needs to be right with God. Now look, I haven't arrived. I haven't made it, but I'm a lot further today than I was years ago. How many of you would say amen that that's the same thing for you? Now, are you with me in saying, God, I want to go even further. I want to go even further. I want to, I want to respond like a believer should respond to everything. I don't want to be reactionary. I want to respond correctly, right? Remember the, the change that God does, it happens from the inside out. It's great if you want to be like, okay, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing that, you know, and, you know, because that's what I need to do as a Christian. Yeah, you can, you can do that if you want to, but where you really need to start is right here. It's got to start right here because we can act really Christian, but God hasn't called us to act Christian. He's called us to be Christians. And that means that you let God do a work inside your heart every day. Now, the, the Bible does say the washing by the reading of the word of God. Guess what? If I want my heart to get better, do more of this. And if you, if you have a problem reading, guess what? The internet's got plenty of resources available for us to have the Bible for free. Writ, just someone reading it to us. You can even watch videos of what's being told. You can watch a video of it so you can get even more deeper understanding. And guess what? They got people on YouTube who are teaching classes that people have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for that you can watch for free and be taught the breakdown, the exegesis of the word of God, where they take every single word and break. I mean, how advanced do you want to get? How much do you want to eat? You want McDonald's Bible or do you want Ruth Chris Bible? Come on. What do you want? What do you want? Because they have it all available. So nobody has an excuse. And if you put more of it in your life, come on, and, and you stop reading it like a history book or stop reading it like a calendar, like you just, okay, I got to do three, three chapters today. Oh, okay, I'll do these three. And then, okay, I, I read my Bible today. Okay, time to go to work. That's ridiculous. You don't do it as a maintenance schedule. You don't do it. It's not, no, it's not a chore. When you uh, have a relationship with somebody, you spend time with them and you have conversation and at least you're supposed to, right? Yeah. Guess what? When you get in your word and you spend time with the Lord, you do the same thing. And it helps some people to write. You read and you write, you're like, man, that was so awesome, man. That scripture just like jumped out and slapped me in the face a couple times and went back down. <laughs> write it down if you need to write it down. Some people like, they're like, oh man, God talked to me. I got to post it. I got to post it. That's okay, but just make sure 
as you're posting it that that was something God spoke to you about. Don't try to make it be about everybody else's business. That's your business. You see what I mean? You, you write it down. You can journal it if you want to. And you guess what? You don't have to write a book when you journal. You can just write a few sentences if you want. But everybody's got to start somewhere. But you got to get in the word. And what you do is you start noticing that as you're reading the word, the word is reading you. And that's when everything changes. That's when everything changes to where it's not just reading a book. It's not just a, a, a routine or a chore. When everything changes is when you're reading the, the, the word of God and you realize it's starting to read you and you're writing the stuff down or you're meditating on it. You're praying it. You're saying, oh, God, I just read. God, thank you for your word. Your word says and you're praying the word, praying the scripture, all of this stuff. Guess what? It can't help but change your heart. It's going to. It's a guarantee it's going to change your heart. It's going to absolutely change your heart. I'm telling you, man, there are people who have been miraculously physically healed just by reading their word. There are people who have been delivered from demons just by reading the word. There have been people who got saved that never had anyone say anything to them about Jesus, but they started reading the word and they got saved. Some of the people that you hear about that are preaching the word of God and planting churches right now, they only got there because they found a Bible and they started reading it. Did you know that even in this wicked world that we live in, most of your hotels that you go to, they still put a Gideon Bible in that hotel room. That's all we got to do is just start reading the word and start just really putting it in there. Like, try it. Try it. Stop talking about, well, my mom and my dad and this, my neighbor and this. Ha- Stop talking about all that. Open the word. Yes, Open the word and say, oh, devil, you want to mess with me? Huh? You want to put depression? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the word. Guess what? The devil hates it when you read your word. He hates it when you turn that worship music on and you start listening to some worship and you open the word. The devil wants you to get mad, depressed, <laughs> stuck upset. He wants you to walk away from God. And guess what? It's hard to do when you want to say, I'm going to walk away from God, but you put your face in the word. You know, the Bible even says, set your face like Flint. Things start getting out of your control and people start acting crazy. Your husband act crazy. Your wife act crazy or your neighbor acts crazy. You know what you do, man, get into the word. I I put the word on you. I put the word on you in Jesus name. It's a life changer, man. It's a game changer. My grandmother instilled the word inside of us. I got so much word in me, thank God, because of my grandma. She she enticed me with candy. I'm serious, man. She, the church got me with those prizes. Like, if you want this, if you want to get, if you want to get this toy right here then you need to be able to recite all the Ten Commandments by next week. Sunday morning at 8.30. You need to be here. And guess what? We'd go into the store with our Bible bucks. And I can buy whatever I want with my Bible bucks because I memorized my Ten Commandments. And then I went to Christian school because my grandmother paid for us to go to Christian school. She said, I'm going to go to work at 60-something years old to put all of my grandkids in Christian school because their parents won't do it. So my grandmother stepped up and said, you're going to Christian school. There ain't no way you're going to these wicked public schools with them pulling the Ten Commandments out and teaching all this sex education. Get out of that school right now. And she took us to the Christian school whether we wanted to go or not. And I went to this Christian school and guess what? So now I got to memorize scripture for church on Sunday. And now I got to memorize scripture in order to pass my grade in school every single week from seventh grade through 12th grade. And guess what? I thank God for all of it. I thank God for it. And you know what? I, I can see now what God was doing. He was preparing me. He was getting me ready for something. And I thank God for it. Because if I would have lived my life without God and without his word, I don't know, I don't know how much I would appreciate it today. Because it seems like in our world today, the word doesn't have the same value as it used to. 
But you know what? For those of you who are sitting here today and your life has been changed by Jesus, you know the value of his word. You know, that's one of the things I love about Billy Graham is I don't care if you wanted to argue about denomination or, you know, or, oh, he, he didn't speak in tongues or he did speak, you know, all that kind of stuff. Let me tell you something. That brother preached the word of God. And God put a gift and an anointing on him that everywhere he preached, even the hardest of hardest people, if they listen to the words that came out of his mouth, they would go before the altar and they'd give their hearts to Jesus. One of those was that guy, remember, who was in the camp. He was a POW. He was an alcoholic. He came out of there and he was hearing that Billy Graham was in town preaching in California, right, right, right down the street from his apartment. And he fought it with everything. His wife wanted to go and she was going. He was getting mad at her for, for going and he didn't want to go. And he, he finally went and he heard the words. And guess what? It, there's nothing he could do about it. Nothing he could do about it. It touched his heart and he had to come to the altar. I believe that, that that same power is alive today. And I believe that if people who call themselves Christians will actually live out the word, more and more people, more and more people are going to come to Jesus. More and more people, people who are not afraid to talk about God. People who are not afraid to share the love of Jesus with folks. Share the word with folks. Amen. Amen. Listen, before I excuse everybody, is there anybody here at church today that you don't know Jesus? Because I, I definitely want to pray with you. There's people here that want to pray with you because they care about where your soul's at. Let me tell you something. If you don't know Jesus as your savior, you won't go to heaven. You'll go to hell. And it is not God's will that anybody should go to hell. He wants everyone to be saved. So if you need Jesus, if you need to be saved, that is the best and most important decision of your life today. And I'm going to tell you this. It ain't, gonna, it, it ain't just going to all of a sudden, it's going to be like cherries and roses and birds and butterflies are going to fly and your life's going to be perfect. And you're not going to have any problems. Matter of fact, you might feel the opposite of that tomorrow because today's Sunday, but Monday's tomorrow. And you might feel like, you know what? All that stuff I heard Man, it ain't working for me today. It feels like all hell's breaking loose. Probably because it is. Because the enemy wants to suck you back into your old life. But if you trust the Lord, he'll change your life. So is there anybody here? I think, is everybody walking with Jesus today? If you're not, don't be embarrassed, man. Just stand up. We'll pray with you. Okay, good. Everybody's walking with Jesus. Now, for those of you walking with Jesus, if the Holy Spirit spoke to you, and said, I need to do a miracle work in your heart today. It's time for this process to begin. It's time for me to do what I'm supposed to do in your heart so that you can walk out in that full life, that full freedom, that life abundantly. I want you to stand up where you're at right now. Stand up where you're at. If the Lord spoke to you and said, it's time to surrender your heart. Are you ready to make that decision today to say, Lord, I'm going to be responsible for what's in my heart and I'm not going to allow stuff in my heart to stay that shouldn't be there. Is there anybody else? Just stand up where you're at. Okay, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord, for the work of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you're talking to me and you're talking to all of us. You're talking to the whole world. And you're telling us to be surrendered to you, to trust you and to trust your word. Lord, for my brothers and sisters today, that know in their heart there are things not surrendered. Father, thank you for coming and doing your work. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Talk to them and show them what is in their heart that needs to be released to you. And as they confess it, God, you'll take it and you'll do something with it. Thank you for that miracle. Thank you for your power and thank you for your love and grace for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Our website is revolutionchurchpdx.com. You can go online and you can 
send us a message. And you can say, hey, be praying for me this week because this is what God told me in service today. Or you can send us a message and say, hey, I didn't feel comfortable standing or whatever, but I gave my life to Jesus today. So pray for me. I want to get plugged in. So get in there and, and, and send us a message. Okay. You can do it from your smartphone, whatever. And if you want to, you can go old school. We got these papers right behind these seats, these cards. You can fill one out. You can fold it in half. You can give it to this man, Dominic, back here. See, he's waving in the corner back here. You can give that to him, and he'll make sure that we receive that, okay? So we can be praying for you. God bless you guys. We appreciate you, and we do love you, and hopefully we'll see you again next week. All right? Have a great day. God bless you. Amen.